you brought up, several of you have brought up the word quality of life, about patient preference, about listening to patients and what they're telling you and letting those factors drive your dose modification or schedule changes. Um, there's a study that's looking at this now that was, uh, that was presented, the Pisces study. Eric, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so the Pisces study was a, a relatively small study, about 169 patients, which was really asking the question whether or not individuals preferred receiving pazopinib versus sunitinib. And the way this trial was designed is that they were randomized between upfront pazopinib versus upfront sunitinib, received either agent for 10 weeks, had a two-week washout, and then switched over to the opposing agent. This was a blinded study. Patients did not really know, nor did the physicians know what they were on. And then at the end of that second round, they were given a questionnaire asking, which drug did they prefer? And 70% of the individuals said that they preferred pazopinib to sunitinib. Now, this was a trial that was carefully designed to take efficacy out of the equation entirely. The patients did not know how well they were doing, and those individuals who did progress after the first set of assessments after 12 weeks weren't actually allowed to answer that questionnaire. So it was a, an efficacy-blinded questionnaire, and it was pretty clear that uh, individuals preferred pazopinib. Now, the interesting thing about this is you don't know how much they preferred pazopinib. We know that they preferred it, but whether or not it was a, they preferred it a lot versus a little, we don't know. Simply preference, uh, and the magnitude of preference was not really stated. So a relatively small phase two study, a very unique design it sounds like, and, and endpoints. Brian, how do you interpret this? I mean, is that, do you have any issues with it? Any uh, concerns or, or any, um, any uh, yeah, insights? I, I mean, first of all, it's, you know, to, to Bernard Escudier and the other investigators' credit, it's a very novel design that we've all talked a lot about, and that's what we should be doing is novel trials, if, even if imperfect. So, so to their credit, they did it. Um, I have a problem with not including efficacy in the patient preference assessment because I have a lot of patients who we sort of maybe struggle through the first few cycles and we were dose or schedule adjusting and managing toxicities and then we get to that first scan, tumors are smaller and they say, you know what, that wasn't so bad. And also, I also warn people, the first two months of a drug are an adjustment period. You're adjusting the side effects, we're adjusting to it, we're, we're maybe literally adjusting dose. So give me a couple months and I'll get you somewhere that will be tolerable over the long term. So, um, so I think that uh, efficacy is a really important part of what patients prefer and doctors. It's, it's, you know, it's, the, it's the benefit side of that risk-benefit equation. Um, the other peculiar thing about the study is that dose interruptions were not allowed. So in standard practice, if somebody got to day 24 of Sutan and was having problems, you would stop the drug, of course, right? You wouldn't squeeze four more days and it just wouldn't make sense. Um, and that could really sort of, you know, bias the results. And part of it's just that, as Bob mentioned, you know, one's continuous dose and one's intermittent dose. So in terms of timing and assessments on compares or how this Pisces study was done, it just naturally introduces some imbalances and biases. I, I don't think it completely invalidates the study. I mean, clearly, pazopinib is a well-tolerated drug. The magnitude of difference was such that I think, you know, it supports it, um, whether it's really a 49% difference in preference or something less than that. You know, I'm not sure is important. But I do think I think I think that what this illustrates, both Compars and Pisces, is you know going back to 2005 until today, we have eight drugs in this space, and we're we're at a time when we're asking what are called comparative effectiveness questions, and we're looking for novel trial designs to ask how one drug compares with another. Compars is one way, not inferiority. Pisces is another, patient preference. These are not the only two ways. And I would, just, I would just remind both the people in the clinic as well as ourselves that what the patient wants is superiority. They want to know effective drugs, what's going to help them control their disease in a balanced and quality of life way. And we as investigators around this table, even though we take care of patients day in and day out, want to keep moving the field forward. So I, I actually credit Compars and Pisces for asking those comparative questions, but we shouldn't take our eye off the ball, which is to find the next generation of effective therapies. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I'm still a little bit concerned and I guess a little bit confused about the, the Pisces study then. So uh, is this a fair comparison to have you know, a switch after three months from one drug to another? That's not our standard practice nor is it our standard practice not to dose interrupt 
when we hit toxicities. It sounds like, from what you've described, Bob, that you, your standard practices are already become different regimens. I mean, how relevant is, uh, is a result like this in terms of, you know, your practice? Do you really, does this change how you select drugs or manage drugs based on results like this? I think the answer is no. And, and the answer is no for a variety of reasons. I, and Brian pointed this out. I, I look at comorbidities. I look at goals of treatment for the patient. I look at their support system. I look at who supports me in the care of patients in terms of my staff, my nurse, my support system. And then I identify a way to approach that patient. And, and the reality is most of us establish goals for the patient before they receive their first drug. And the more the patient is a partner with you in the delivery of their care, my view is that the better they tolerate the treatments that they're about to receive. So I, I think Pisces will help inform people that it's safe to go ahead and try pisopinib or sunitinib in the frontline setting. I don't, th I don't think it tells us that one or the other is better or worse. It just tells us it's safe to do that. Compar says that the outcomes are comparable and then it's, it's what do I feel comfortable, what does my staff feel comfortable with, and, and, uh, and what other information exists in the literature, for example, the two-in-one schedule that Brian and, and Eric pointed out, that allows me to even modify further before it even gets into the literature based on personal experience. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. I, you know, well stated. I mean, I think it's, you know, with every patient I, I find myself you know, telling them about risk and benefit. It's all about risk and benefit. And we're not curing people with, with this current generation of targeted therapy. So we're trying to get the patient to a place that, that they can tolerate drug over the long term. Um, and that might be with drug A, it might be with drug B. And, and again, I think to echo Bob's point, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the experience of your staff in dealing with side effects. You know, because it's not just me, of course. You know, it's my entire nursing staff and everyone else. So that, that, that team really plays, plays into how you choose drugs for patients. And so Dan, I don't think we've answered your question. You, you posed a question to us, does the data allow us to choose one drug over another drug in our practices? And it really doesn't. Right. And what you've heard, I think everyone say, is that it's just provided supportive evidence that you can use either one. But at the end of the day, there's all these extraneous factors that are so important. Right, right, right. Do you talk about both drugs to patients? Do you kind of look, make, make that assessment and say, okay, that's the drug I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna offer to this patient. How do you, how do you balance that? So, you know, we're in a, an internet savvy generation here. So I think it's the days where the majority of patients walk in, never hearing of the drugs is, is long past. They have family members or whatever that have searched and they come in with their list of drugs. So I usually make sure as, as giving a second opinion or as an expert opinion that I've touched base on all the the options for frontline therapy. That sometimes even involves things like high-dose IL-2. I make sure that they've at least heard it and they understand my rationale for choosing the drug I choose. I ultimately will have to make the choice between using Sutent or Pazopinib, um, Sunidinib or Pazopinib or Temsorolimus or IL-2, but I want them to understand what my rationale is and at least have heard it because I think we, we need to do that for our patients. They need to feel comfortable and I think if you don't let them know that therapies exist, and they sometimes question, you know, your sincerity in being their physician. And the other part of that is, is that even though these agents primarily target the same pathways, mm -hmm. to the patient and their family, they, they seem like completely different drugs because they have different names. Mm -hmm. So part of our education is to actually help them understand that just because they have different names doesn't mean they're doing something differently. Right. And, and, and a lot of what we do, I, I agree with Tom completely, a lot of what we do is educate the semi-informed patient about how to interpret information and then ultimately as experts in practice in kidney cancer I think it's, in, it's, it's critical, critical for us to synthesize the data, interpret the information and make rational choices that's individual for a given patient because that's what they come to us for. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean I guess I'll disagree a little bit. I tend to be a little more paternalistic in my approach to patients, I decide before I go in the room what I'm gonna offer the patient. Um, an exception might be high dose IL-2, which I think is special circumstance and sort of a, a carve out, but if I'm choosing between two TKIs, you know, having had many long discussions and at the end they say, well, well what do you think I should do? They, they come to me for my expert opinion. This is what I do all day, every day. So before I go in there, I have a plan. Right. Might be clinical trial, might be drug A or drug B. Um, and then I explain the rationale of why I 
chose that. Right, and, the alternatives. and sometimes they'll say, well, what about drug X and Y? And then, I, then I'll go into it. So it, you know, it also depends on the sophistication level of the patient and how many family members are in the room, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> the more family members, the, the more nuanced that discussion is going to be, et cetera. But I, I might have a little different approach. Well, I think yeah. that's really helpful insight into how, how we take this clinical trial data, how we actually apply it, what that you know, conversation looks like uh, in, the, in the room with a patient that's newly diagnosed with metastatic kidney cancer. But these aren't...